Hey Lake Point, Pastor Michael here to get you caught up on the fifth week of our series, Holy Sexuality. And this week, Nate tackled the question of how does our sexuality fit into God's grand story? You see, the Bible is a collection of writings that come together to tell one overarching story that's meant to give meaning and purpose to our lives. So what is the story? Well, it begins with an original ideal. In Genesis 1 and 2, we read about in the beginning when God first formed the world and everything was as intended. Repeatedly in the creation account, we read how God formed things and called them good. This included the sexual union between a man and a woman united in marriage. Unfortunately, like most stories, their utopian-like existence did not last long. By the third chapter, we see conflict emerge and it has a name, sin. Instead of heeding God's wisdom, Adam and Eve spurn his loving leadership and decide to live on their own terms. They eat the forbidden fruit and they lose their innocence. Immediately, they become aware of their sin and shame and so they hide from God and they turn on each other. Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent. Hostility emerges between all parties and spreads to Adam and Eve's offspring each born with a sinful nature. I mean, look no further than their two eldest sons, the one kills the other. This is the story of how humanity begins. Things quickly go from bad to worse. The sin nature in every human has changed their overall trajectory from obedience to rebellion. This is evidenced throughout the Old Testament. After the fall, humanity seems paralyzed to address its own brokenness, and despite God's interactions with the nation of Israel, the brokenness and or incompleteness of humanity only becomes increasingly obvious. Religion proves ineffective in resolving it. God gives them the promised land, a, a space where they can avoid all the bad people. He gives them the law, rules, so that they can know the difference between right and wrong. He gives them kings, strong leaders to, to follow. He gives them prophets, accountability, and, and strict consequences for their disobedience. None of it has the power to transform the human heart. We see that even the best religion, one given directly by God, one that has all the right rules, one that offers a safe little cocoon called the promised land, one that has strong spiritual leaders like David and Solomon, one that dishes out the most severe harsh accountability through prophets in exile, it does not have the power to transform the human heart. And so by the end of the Old Testament, things look bleak for God's people. They have proven that religion does not give them the capacity to rectify their situation and live life the way God intended them for them to live in the garden. Yet, like all epic narratives, when things are at their darkest, the light of a surprising twist shines more brightly. That surprising twist, of course, is Jesus. Israelites were expecting a Messiah, a deliverer, a rescuer, but they were not expecting the Messiah to be God's own son or for him to save them from their sin. They had the religious system, the law of Moses, the temple, the priests, and sacrifices to atone for their sin and keep them holy. And so the surprising twist in the story is that God would intervene and do for them what they could not do for themselves. And so God sends his son, unlike Adam, the first human being, Jesus, who is also fully man, he, he lives a perfect life and then dies a perfect death. His death and resurrection and the sending of his spirit made it possible for a new humanity, one that would no longer be governed by sin and evil, but by his love and leadership. These people would be given new hearts and they would reflect his character to the world around them. That would include their sexuality. In the first century Roman culture, most men would have a wife who was for procreation and for raising the children, a mistress who was for heterosexual pleasure on the side, and a young man who was for homosexual pleasure on the side as well sense of orientation or being faithful to your orientation, let alone being faithful to your wife, was a, a foreign concept to them. It was a male-dominated society. Women and children were second-class citizens and were often used and abused. Men would have sex with whomever and however they wanted. It wasn't about love but lust. It wasn't about giving but taking. It wasn't about uniting but using. Christianity changed that. Men were called to be holy as Christ is holy. They were called to love their wives and be faithful to them, to serve them and put their needs ahead of their own. All of this would be made possible not through religion, but through God's empowering presence, which would transform their hearts and unite them as a, a new spiritual family. These people would become known as the way. It led to an era of restoration, aka the church. We read about the early church in the book of Acts. They would grow into the most powerful movement in the history of our world. What made them stand out was their love. It was a, a love and a compassion that our world had never seen. 
Back then, it was common for families to discard unwanted babies. Christians would go to the trash heaps to rescue them and raise them as their own. Back then, it was uncommon for people to associate with those outside their social class, but Christians knew no such distinction. distinctions. Everyone, rich and poor, male and female, Jew and non-Jew, were accepted around the Lord's table, and they shared their possessions freely with one another. For 2,000 years now, whenever the church has been at its best, when God's love is fueling their actions, they have been a redemptive force in our world. Scripture reveals that this will one day culminate with one final stage in God's grand story, which is the superior ideal, a, a new creation. The Apostle John describes it as the new heavens and the new earth where God will make his home. It will be like the Garden of Eden in the creation story, but only better. Because this time, all the nations of the earth will bring the best parts of their cultures and civilizations to the table. It's why the scriptures refer to it as a garden city. God's vision from the beginning was for humanity to fill the earth and rule over it. And this is what we will do for all of eternity, serving alongside and under God's perfect leadership. Now, here's the big takeaway from God's grand story. God sees each of us the same, highly valued, made in his image, the, the pinnacle of his creation. He sees us deeply fallen, fragmented, and, and distorted by sin. He sees us as greatly loved, passionately pursued, and redeemed by our creator. Now, why is this so important? It's because it means there is no us or them. As Nate shared, in our modern times, we like to identify people according to their sexual orientation, but God doesn't do that. He identifies each of us as the same, sinful, in need of his grace and love. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 3.23. He says, there is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No difference between rich and poor or young and old, black or white, male or female, gay or straight. Our orientation is all the same. We all have a sin nature that only Jesus can resolve. That's why the Apostle Paul writes that, we all need his redemption in our lives, that there is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Sin is the great problem that plagues us all. Jesus is the great solution. In the 90s, a, a debate started to emerge as to whether you could be born gay. Dr. Christopher Ewan has a brilliant response to this sensitive topic, and so I wanna share it with you. From a young age, he experienced same-sex attraction, and he wrote the following. Of the numerous studies conducted to investigate the potential biological and environmental factors that may influence the development of same-sex attractions, nothing yet has been conclusive. Yet, innateness doesn't mean something is permissible. For being born a sinner doesn't make sin right. Regardless of what was true or not when you were born, Jesus says you must be born again. It doesn't matter whether you think you were born an alcoholic, you must be born again. It doesn't matter whether you think you were born with a specific sexual sin struggle, you must be born again. When we're born again, the old has gone and the new has come. We are a new creation. We can hate our sin without hating ourselves. Our sexuality is no longer who we are, but, but how we are. We put to death our old self so that Christ can live in us. The effect of sin is so pervasive, so complete, so radical that complete rebirth must occur for anyone to enter the kingdom of heaven. Whatever our condition upon coming into the world, we need a total transformation, the kind that our God and Creator has made inexplicably possible only by grace through faith in Christ. This isn't a message just for the gay community or only for those experiencing same-sex attraction. This is a message for everybody. You must be born again. Friends, as a church, that needs to be our message, that we all need to be born again. Folks, biblical sexuality is not heterosexuality. For instance, you could be heterosexual and be a teen who's looking at pornography or be a young adult and sleeping around or be dating and having sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend or be married and cheating on your spouse. All of those behaviors are fairly normal in today's society, but without question, all of these behaviors are sinful in God's eyes. Biblical sexuality is not heterosexuality, it is holy sexuality. God declares that only sex between a husband and a wife in marriage is good. Every other sexual expression outside of this context, whether in an opposite sex relation or in a same sex relationship, God condemns it as sinful. Holy sexuality consists of two paths, chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage, which is not some new paradigm. From Genesis to Revelation in the entirety of God's grand story, only two paths have ever aligned with God's standard for sexual expression. If you're single, flee lustful desires and be sexually abstinent. If you're married, flee lustful desires and be sexually and emotionally faithful to your spouse. That's the goal. Holiness, set apart, 
reflecting God's character. Heterosexuality will not get you into heaven. Heterosexuality is not the ultimate goal for those with same-sex attractions. God never said, be heterosexual as I am heterosexual. He said, be holy as I am holy. Consider what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Paul explains that when we are born again, we are set free from our old sin nature. This doesn't mean freedom from temptation or even sinning again, but it's a decisive break from the bondage of sin where our mind is less dark and our will is less rebellious. Why? Because Christ now lives inside of you. Paul continues to count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. And so what is grace? Grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. Grace is God's empowering presence that gives us the ability to do what we otherwise could not do, be holy. We don't make ourselves holy, God does. How? When we rely on his grace, his empowering presence. We all suffer from the same problem, sin. We all require the same solution, Jesus. Well, friends, thanks for listening. Enjoy jumping in discussion questions. I'll see you next time.